we are in week 44, eight weeks to go. And it has really been a pleasure to kind of bring to you God's Word every week. Our goal is to help you understand and make it through where you're reading. Surprisingly for me, Jeremiah has been a tough book. In fact, I'm so committed to getting uh, out of it, I've slowed down. And now I've got to catch up uh, where everybody else is at. But uh, hopefully this week will help you in the room today. By the way, my voice is a little scratchy. Um, I'm fine. I'm healthy. I'm good. It's just a season or <laughs> something. And uh, I guess that's a relative thing. That's why everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Move, move on. <laughs> fine. Nothing to see here. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm hurting. Allergies. No, 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 allergies. no. It feels no, good. No, no. And I've got a high pain tolerance, too. So, yeah. I mean, we can, we can do A lot of that's going around here. A lot of that. Going around here. <laughs> so that's how done. In the room, we got Don Myers yeah. and Henry Sears, yep. Clayton. Uh, has been doing a great job running the uh, yes, producing it for us. Yes. And so let's jump right in it. We are now, we're still with Jeremiah. Actually, we're but, done. But we're in the book of Lamentations. Yes. And Don is standing up. Doing <laughs> if, so on, if only there were video. If, 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 uh, I don't. I'm telling you, because I can't. We, have, we have a good time <laughs> during this up, podcast. Asking like, acting like he was riding a horse. Yeah. Doing a little Yahoo thing. Yes, I'm fearful to describe. <laughs> so anyway, oh. so Emery, let's start yeah. with. Uh, well then. Obviously, there's not a lot of lamentations going on with minting in this. Yeah, I am day. not a horse dancing. No, no. no. Um, so uh, lamentations yes. three. So Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, a couple of things that uh, you wouldn't necessarily catch in the English translation of Lamentations that just speak to how amazing Scripture is. So Lamentations is actually poetry. It's five chapters of poetry. And what you don't see in the English version is that the first two chapters, every verse is an acrostic. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and each verse starts with a consecutive letter, of the alphabet just like in psalm i believe it's 119 that each section starts with uh, a letter of the alphabet and it keeps going on it's a super long Sweet. psalm same thing you know you don't nice really job. see that nice job well it's pretty cool that you know it is very powerful in the way that mm -hmm. it says things and not only does it accomplish that it had to accomplish it within the framework of being an acrostic super hard to mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. so it's kind of a poetic uh super artful thing in the first place but what it describes uh is the opposite of awesome so this is the most catastrophic mm -hmm. event in all of israel's and history before you jump in there yeah. i know one of the slams of from some people they slam christianity because they don't think that it it, it has much to offer the arts yeah and mm -hmm. so not true so not true if you study the, the history of of art a lot mm -hmm. of the great works were done by christians you know, and certainly there's a lot done by non-Christians, but uh, who wanted to express God's glory and majesty. Well, here you got something that is very artsy, yeah. very poetic, and in Hebrew, this is high literature. Absolutely, uh, yeah. This is this is quality quality writing that often, like you yep. just said, doesn't translate well into our. Uh, yeah, we kind of kind of miss some of the mm -hmm. the coolness of that because it has to be translated into a way that we. Can it's kind of like when Adam said to Eve, "You are now bone of my bone, yeah, flesh of my flesh." Um, you know, you just means so much more. It does, and yeah. in, in the Hebrew, that is so rich mm -hmm. and poetic and a play on words. And I mean, it, but in Absolutely. our English, hey, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. <laughs> yeah, it's know? just a, it's something. Seems Tell that to odd. your wife tonight over yeah. the internet. Or... Well, I, the the whole uh, Proverbs thirty one deal is like to us in our language is weird, but to them it was very poetic. And, and very spicy. Uh, but Lamentations, so uh, there's a couple things that are important about Lamentations. First of all, the lament, you know, crying out to God. It, it, only, it doesn't only happen in Lamentations, it also happens in Psalms. There, there are Psalms of lament. Uh, the, it's a poetry form uh, that they use, but actually from the guy who has a psychology background, it also has a psychological purpose. God's not afraid of your emotions. And, and, and God doesn't want you to stuff your emotions like you have to be this stoic person that mm -hmm. doesn't ever feel negative emotions. They're experiencing this terrible event, and it actually is a healthy way 
to process and to work through how we, how they as a nation are feeling at the moment when like everything is falling down. Because sometimes we have to process before we can decide to do things differently. And, and they're in that, in that place. So it's okay to express emotions as part of the, the message of lamentations. Don't let emotions lead your life, but it is okay to express them. Uh, two really important things about lamentation, though. I love, uh, you just got to have this verse right in the middle of all the awful verse, uh, chapter 3, 22 through 24. There have been more praise songs written about this lately than I think almost anything there is. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, uh, the Lord is my portion. Uh, and in, in the middle of all the craziness, they know that, yeah, we're, we're being rebuked. We're being disciplined for all of our disobedience. But still in the middle of that, uh, God's faithfulness is, is new every morning. And God has a plan uh, of redemption for us. And so you get to the end. You got you to gotta love the end of this, right? So there's the last two verses of the book of Lamentation. Uh, Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. The end. So here's the thing. Right? In our culture, we want everything in life to wrap up like a situation comedy. There's a problem. There's a solution. And at the end of 30 minutes, it's all taken care of. Hallmark movie. Hallmark movie formula, the very <laughs> formula. Yeah, and, Pastor, and Mike's in that, in, Pastor Mike's in a Hallmark movie. He <laughs> is. He is. Please watch it. Uh, but we do. We want that from life. And but the truth is, we have to look back over our life and go. Life doesn't resolve itself into nice, neat little chapters. And, and we need faithfulness to keep going on because sometimes God's playing the long game, and it, but we want it to all wrap up in the short game. So I, I do like that. Lamentations presents life. As it is, it's not in nice little boxes where there's a happy ending to everything that happens in the immediate and in the here and now. Because we get in trouble when we expect that of life, and it doesn't happen when we have that expectation. So, moving on to the book of Ezekiel. Oh my lands! If you thought Jeremiah was difficult to understand, oh, don't <laughs> by the way, if you're having trouble, because we were talking about the big takeaway from Jeremiah. I think the same mm -hmm. takeaway for Jeremiah is the same one for Lamentations. Mm -hmm. And it's that sin brings pain and tears and heartache, mm -hmm. but God's always ready to show yeah. mercy yep. when we repent and so return true. to him. Yeah, that is the, the big flyover for both yeah. of those books, both written by Jeremiah. Both of those books uh, do that. So for Ezekiel, I just want to really quickly give you a couple things because, oh my lands, you could spend like an entire sermon on a couple verses of Ezekiel and never be able to finish it out. So Ezekiel was a priest. He had been tra trained to be a priest uh, for years and years and years. You can't be a priest in Israel until you're 30 years old. And he gets taken captive right before he is able to walk into being a priest. So he gets taken to uh, Babylon and he now is a priest of God with the exiled people in Babylon. A couple of really important things to look. Uh, super interesting. They're called sign acts. So you, you have a, a, uh, a culture that is not literate, largely not literate. So they can't read. So what, how do you get God's message across to somebody who can't read? Well, in the 1500s, you use stained glass. Mm. But when you go this early, what do you do? You have a prophet, and you tell him to do stuff like God tells Ezekiel to do. Like build this tiny model of Jerusalem, and then like you're a kid playing with a toy, lay siege to it, mm -hmm. and then destroy it. Or... Uh, uh, shave off all your hair and cut it up with a sword into different pieces to symbolize uh, some things. Or uh, lay on your side for 390 days, tied up and unable to move, uh, to symbolize uh, how long uh, Israel was unfaithful. And then turn over 40 days on the other side, one day for each year that Judah was unfaithful. Shoot. Yeah, that, like if you're looking for a role model, um, wow, I hope you don't ever have to be Ezekiel mm -mm. Uh, because these guys are... Just say, be faithful, people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Easier on my body. 
And Danya, you you bring up like such an important thing with all the major prophets and all the minor prophets. We're so, we're so hard headed as human beings. Mm -hmm. Like you, if you just follow God, there's mm -hmm. goodness in that, and then you don't have to have all of these things that happen yes. that eventually have huge consequences mm -hmm. to the life. Sin uh, sin feels good for a second for a mm -hmm. season, I think it says, mm -hmm. uh, but like it. it it catches up with you. God has a way that he's not trying to punish you with his will. He's trying to bring you into the goodness that he has for you and that he paid for for you. So Ezekiel is that. I just caution everyone with with uh, the handling of books like Ezekiel. Um, just be careful who you listen to. Uh, I'm always a little cautious with people that will take a book as complex as Ezekiel or the second half of Daniel and just tell you they know what every little sentence and every little thing means, and they've got that figured out, often figuring it out with the United States at the center of all end times prophecy and, and all that kind of stuff. Just, just be discerning. Be discerning as to what you read into it. Don't, But don't miss the message of Ezekiel, just like Jeremiah, that um, no matter what you do, God has a plan for you, and his plan for you is to be in the right place in relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Life goes better. Life goes easier that way. Good stuff, good stuff. And as you read through Ezekiel, and I always get lost because people are so, they see a prophetic something. In everything. In everything. And I think the, the centerpiece of prophecy is not the Antichrist. It is not the tribulation. It is the glory of God. Revelation mm -hmm. 3 and 4 and Revelation 11. It, it yeah. is the glory of God that God is on the throne. And I think that's what, when I read through Ezekiel, the, you know, Valley of the Dry Bones and all that, I just try to remember it's about God's glory and, uh, and God's honor. Good stuff. So now we go to the New Testament, and we are in the book of Hebrews, my, one of my favorite, if not my yeah, favorite, it's my New favorite. Testament book. It's so I'm really book. expecting some gems here. I'm, I'm really expecting some quality insight. So I can learn about my favorite book. Well, I'm going to be streamlined since we're on a podcast, so I can only give so much. But I have to start in Philemon, because that's where we're starting. Uh, we go <laughs> Phil Phil Philemon oh, 1 through Hebrews 6.20. Philemon, if you're afraid to go it's to written, Hebrews, I understand. It's written in AD 61 uh, during Paul's imprisonment. Uh, it's a letter that was probably sent alongside Paul's letter to the Colossians. Uh, here, Philemon. The theme is forgiveness. And I want to read, uh, Paul, is, Paul has a prayer here uh, for uh, Philemon. He says, I always thank my God when I pray for you. He says, I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. And I love that line. I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from faith. So I want to ask us, as we start off, just question number one, what comes from your faith? If Paul was writing this letter to you, what would he say, Don Myers, I want you to put into action the blank that comes from your faith. The idea is there is to be a product. There's to be a result of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. It's to change how we live. And so I just want to challenge you to just ask yourself that question. Analyze your life and just say, man, what? What is the product? What, what does the Lord want me to put into action uh, from the faith that I have in Christ and Christ alone? The theme is forgiveness uh, between Philemon and Onesimus. There's a lot of, there's a, a it, it's kind of, it's got some wonderful humorous points. In verse 19, you'll find some humor in that when, when uh, Paul says, I'll pay back all of um, Onesimus's debts, but then again, you owe me your soul. But I'll, I'll take care of his debts. But but then again, you owe me your soul, Philemon. So it's like what debt? You know, it's like these aren't equal, are they? But so it's kind of got some humor in that in Paul in Paul in Paul's writing. Then we move on to Hebrews. In Hebrews, man, there is so much. Uh, this was probably my favorite Bible class in uh, Bible college, and I loved. I loved studying the book of Hebrews uh, as, a, as a young man, and it's still one of my favorite books. But let me just say here, Christ is superior. The sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ is clearly on display in Hebrews. And it's something that I have just been 
repeatedly reminded of, as we've walked through the New Testament, how first Christ was, he's trying to tell people, hey, I'm the truth, I'm the way. And he, he's, he's talking to them about his authority, about his sufficiency, about his superiority, about that he can forgive sins, and how often this authority, the superiority of Christ comes over and over again, and then it just gets stronger, and it gets entrenched. Uh, you know, Christ is talking about himself while he's here, then he has the miracles to prove it and back it up. Uh, and then now Paul, or, well, we don't know if it's, uh, we, I don't really think it's Paul uh, when, I, when I look into it, but there's a number of authors that uh, it could possibly be attributed to, but the writer of Hebrews is saying in this that Christ is, and he lays out this beautiful theological display that says Christ is superior. It's actually stunning and appropriate that Christ would be so supreme and so sufficient for what we need. Um, this book is absolutely beautiful. Let me just hit a few things really quickly here. God exalts the Son in verse 3. The Son radiates. Christ is great. <laughs> The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the sun is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. This supremacy, superiority of Christ that we've kind of been saying, believe in him, Christ, kind of, Christ was saying all along, believe in me, and now... The writer of Hebrews is saying, believe in God. And it's actually coming uh, in these final days. It says, God promised everything to the Son. God has spoken to us through his Son. So this is God himself saying, this is superior. Christ is superior. And Jesus Christ is truly the name by which our sins can be forgiven. For, and then God exalts the Son, keeps doing it over the angels. He exalts him over Moses uh, because Moses is just the prophet. He is the highest prophet, greatest prophet in scriptures to the Jews. And I want to remind you, as you're reading this, the Jews are probably undergoing fierce persecution. Uh, socially and physically, they're being persecuted from the Jews, from the Romans. And in the middle of this fierce persecution, they're going, okay, Jews say we're not following Jesus, right? Paul is, is giving his life in prison. Uh, there's so much persecution going on what if I just don't stand up for Christ as much? I mean, the temptation would be, in the face of persecution, what if I just... No, because of Christ, because Christ is superior, we have to endure and not drift. That is a huge thing that comes over and over here in chapter 2. Listen carefully to the truth, or you may drift away from it. In chapter 3, don't harden your hearts. Don't rebel. Uh, in verse 8, verse 15, it says it again. In chapter 4 and in verse 7, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. There is I, this idea that when we hear the truth of Christ as supreme, we have to face a choice what we're going to do with it. And are we going to drift? Are we going to become dull in our hearing? Are we going to harden our hearts as Israel did in the Old Testament? Are we going to keep our hearts soft toward the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word. I'm going to move all the, um, oh, I've got to go to verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desire. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. The word of God is alive, is powerful. It's not just to be read. It's not just to be read. It's to be listened to. It's to be heeded. It's to be, if you're just reading God's word, as even as we're all walking through the Bible uh, uh, together as a church, if we're just reading, we're missing it. It is to be heeded. It is to be followed. It is, it is to change how we live our lives because of the truth of God's word. Uh, because everything is naked and exposed before uh, his eyes, and he is the one to whom we all must give account. And so I just want to hold that up to us. Um, I'm going to end with these verses that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Listen to how, how high and exalted Christ is. Let us hold firmly to what we believe in the middle of persecution that they're going through. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he didn't sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. So heed his word. Christ is the one to whom we intercede to for the forgiveness of our sins, and there is no other name above his name. That's awesome. You know, you kept, you, you let out with that he's superior. Mm -hmm. He's superior, and what Hebrews does is he goes down and tells us what he's superior to. Mm -hmm. You know, he's superior than all humanity, you know, and talks about the superiority of God mm -hmm. and then how his superiority over humans and, um, and how Jesus is superior than the high priest. He's superior than Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. He's sub, uh, superior than the Old Testament covenant. Um, he, he's just superior uh, in every way. And the, the Hebrews were in danger of turning back, and they wondered if it was worth it. And he's telling them that he is, Jesus is superior to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Don't turn Don't back. back. Don't quit. Don't go back. And so this is where... Your Exodus and Leviticus reading comes into play because you really got to lean on the Old Testament. It's not going to make much sense if you don't go back and go, all right, who is Melchizedek? Let me remind myself what the high priest is. And this is Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, um, you know, kind of 2.0, but just to help you. Uh, understand it better. I love the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. It is tremendous. We move to... It's one of the top five. Pastor was giving out top five books. I'm putting it in one of the top five. Hebrews if top we five. had to if we had to have a top five. If we, if we had a top five. <laughs> it's, it's, cool. <laughs> it's cool with what you started with, the challenge of what does your faith change about your life or what does mm. your change bring about in your life when in a few chapters in Hebrews where we see sure. multiple examples mm. and they start with by faith Mm, and then it yeah. lays it out by faith mm -hmm. and it lays it out and it shows that's that's really cool yeah yeah wisdom literature sure if you want to bring All it right. bring, well, last bring week, it Clay last week we talked about uh, the fool <laughs> and the uh, sluggard and so this week we're going to move away from that and move to something a little different in Proverbs we are in chapter 26 verse 20 through the end of the chapter and then the first three verses in chapter 27 Man, this passage has a lot to do, and a lot of people aren't going to like this, but a lot to do with how we use our mouth, what we say, what comes from it. In these 11 verses, he uses words um, like speech, lips, tongue, mouth, 10 different times in 11 verses. Uh, so pretty, pretty pointed there on what we're talking about here. Uh, and we just talked about the, the positive and the negative when it comes to being obedient to Christ and not being obedient to Christ. And we see a lot of that here. A lot of this is when we use our tongue for negative, here's what follows from it. Here's yeah. the result from it. Um, even starting in uh, verse 21, it says, As a charcoal for embers and wood for a fire, so the quarrelsome person for kindling strife. And if you look up the quarrels quarrelsome right there, that's talking about somebody who uses their words to stir up trouble. Um, so again, yeah. going back to our speech, going back to what is said, mm -hmm. um, going into verse 23. Yeah, that's a great point because the intent of their words mm -hmm. is to stir up a conflict yeah. Yeah. between people. Our people did just like that. I, th I think that is so culturally important for today because we have like this thing now that says, well, isn't it my right to say whatever to I think, whenever I think, however I think? Yeah. No. And it's, is it? Yeah. But that's our culture. You're unsure. That's sure. <laughs> yeah. And that's our that's our culture. Whether it be on social media, whether it be a, a, in personal discourse, whatever it is, we have just that, that's that's how our culture lives now. It's not how God wants us to live. No. Our culture. It's very much an inward look and not looking mm -hmm. beyond ourselves. Well, you know, there there is a proverb, and I don't remember where it is right now. But basically, I don't want to paraphrase, but it says better to keep quiet yeah. than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Is, mm -hmm. that in, is that where you're at right now? Is that part it's of not. Like, well, it should be. It should be. <laughs> There's a lot about, it should be brought in. A lot about our words and speech there. But not that one. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, and then even in 23, and this is where kind of deception comes in also, it says smooth lips 
with an evil heart or like the glaze of an earthen vessel. So you think about the pottery and all that was made back in that time and how they would put a, they'd use all kinds of different materials to make that smooth, glossy finish of it. And how even though it may look uh, nice and pretty on the outside, but what are the true motives that are coming from within? This has nothing to do with biblical exegesis. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going there, huh? <laughs> Why are you doing this in my <laughs> I, can re I remember we, I was reading through. I had this verb um, um, devotional that just took Proverbs and broke it down. And I remember reading this verse and I paused on, you know, got real slow as I came to glazed. And one of my, and I just hesitated a little bit and went and stayed, you know, pottery is the answer. But I went glazed and one of my boys went donuts. Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's goodness inside of those. So that there, yeah, <laughs> it's a humorous D6 moment. <laughs> hey, we'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> oh, I'm off track. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep, you are. <laughs> Point being, lots about speech, how we use our words, how we use our mouths, um, and ultimately, I think I think another good challenge for us is to think through. Man, do your words bring life or do they bring death? Mm. Uh, our tongue is one of the most powerful things we have access mm -hmm. to as humans. And we have a choice each and every day. Um, sometimes, just like we've talked about, whether or not to open it or just keep it shut. And then if we do open it, what are we spewing from it? Uh, are we spewing truth? Or even if we spew truth, we are supposed to spew it in love. Uh, and so thinking through how we're presenting truth. Are we presenting truth? Are we presenting death? How is that impacting the people around us? Are they better off from what they've heard or have we caused damage that is need to be repaired? Uh, and so think through that. Try to be intentional about that. I don't think it's something that's just going to come naturally, uh, but hopefully through being intentional, spending time in God's Word, uh, our hearts are transformed. And therefore, Scripture says, from the heart, the mouth overflows. And so that will begin to change our speech also. I think almost and, the... the almost verbatim the concept is in James yeah yeah I'm, I'm like the very same context how powerful yeah, the, the time yeah, can start a fire can move a, a boat deadly, yeah, yeah. Unruly, yeah. You know, but no and, uh, deadly and it, it actually kind of like a like rhetorical question who in the world is able to keep their tongue in check all the time that's how yeah. power how powerful it is yeah absolutely I mean then just one one last thing at the start of 27 um these first two verses, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day might bring. And in verse two, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. And so again, talking about our language and our speech there, but more than that, man, um, I think God detests pride. And I, I think along with that, I think our fellow man does also. Uh, we may <laughs> see pride in a number of different areas. But with our words, with our pride, that is not something that is going to put people closer to Jesus. If that is how we are representing ourselves, uh, if that's how we're speaking to people, we must be coming at the truth and at our relationships humbly and uh, making sure we are, we are sharing the right information and we are being uplifting and not, not degrading, not belittling. So, yeah. yeah. You know, and even, even when we use humor, Yes, we got to be careful that we're not degrading. Yeah, you know, How and using it is. right and using that as a cover. Well, I was just kidding. <laughs> yep. When the intent of our heart is really true, you know. Um, there's actually a verse in Proverbs about that. The person who I think it's in Ephesians. Where it's it talks, well, there's one in Proverbs. Proverbs. Oh, okay. That, that talks about the person that you know. Basically, you're foolish if you're the person that says something sarcastic and ugly to your neighbor, and then you say, "I'm oh, just kidding." Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times we, we do it to get a reaction. Mm -hmm. And then when it's not the reaction, then we go, ah, just kidding. You know? It's easy to go too and far. Like that lets us off the hook. Mm -hmm. And it may let us off the hook, but it doesn't change the attitude of our heart. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's a snapshot of what's going on in your heart in that moment. And, um, you know, it's... Um, yeah. So, did you find it? I did not. It's about... We just talked about it. About foolish jesting and yes. talk. 
I remember it because I was talking about it with teen boys who a very guilty <laughs> party when it comes to uh, doing whatever it takes to get the laugh. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, great length. I remember when we hit that point, it got very quiet and yeah. nobody wanted to share a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, absolutely. Our words have so much power, and I think there are a lot of times that we do not even realize what all is happening when the words are coming from our mouths. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like toothpaste, and you can give all kind of examples, but your words are like toothpaste, and no matter how hard you try and no matter how sorry you are mm-hmm. and regretful are, you can't put it all back mm-hmm. in the tube and act like it never happened. It, yeah. it just doesn't work that way. So guard your heart and watch what you say. Clayton has now found, found Ephesians 4.29, no foul language, some say unwholesome speech, should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Good. Good word. Good word. Well, guys, I just want you to know uh, I appreciate your study and your time. For those of you who are reading God's word, Mm. man, continue to do so. If you've stopped and you just jumped in today, man, just start today. You know, I got behind (laughs) intentionally because I wanted to grab something out of Jeremiah. I'll probably be behind in Ezekiel too, but that's okay. But I'll finish, um, you know, with with everybody. So mm-hmm. enjoy God's word as you read it, and mm-hmm. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you in church on Sunday.